Abandon all colour, all ye who enter here. Back in 2020, I began this channel with three videos. A teaching video, a Q&A video, and a film video. One looking at The Matrix. The film which could be considered as the new standard for action films at the start of the new millennium. We each could point out at least five works which have taken inspiration from the franchise. And of course it was a success financially, so a trilogy came along before we knew it. The sequel continued with more of the same from the first film, but became bogged down under the weight of its own ideas, and as a result was more of a mixed bag. So how will this film fare? Will it deliver a satisfying end to the franchise, or will it just be a repeat of the sequel? Let's take a look and find out, starting with the plot. The Wooing One returns, still played by Keanu Reeves. After the events of part two, Neo finds himself stuck in the limbo between the Matrix and the real world, with his allies trying to find a way to get him out. But while that is going on, the machines are making their way to the Sanctuary of Zion, seeking to destroy the vestiges of humanity that can continue to resist. Once Trinity and Morpheus, played by Carrie Ann Moss and Lawrence Fishburne, find Neo, he regroups with them and realizes that he needs to go to the center of the machines to finish all this. As while the machines are trying to destroy the rebellion, Agent Smith, played by Hugo Weaving, continues to spread throughout the Matrix, taking it over. Alliances are tested as the war reaches its zenith, but who will be left standing once the dust is cleared? Considering how a fourth one has been released, it kind of takes away the zeal from the ending, doesn't it? Once again, it is safe to say that this is a film with maybe a few good ideas and some interesting philosophical notions, but becomes overrun by the weight of the bad ideas or poor execution. This is also apparently the film where acting quality got deleted as watching this film was akin to watching paint dry, although actually I think watching paint dry is actually more entertaining. The way I see it, when it comes to a trilogy, there is a simple structure to follow. Call it a structural theory I have developed based on the overall trend of movie and television trilogies. 1. Establish the world. 2. Bend the world. And 3. Break the world. To articulate what I mean, let us take a look at a good example, Avatar The Last Airbender. In the first season, we establish the world we are watching, the main characters we are due to follow, Aang, Katara and Sokka, with Zuko as the primary antagonist. We learn about the magic system and how it works, as well as what the structures of the world at large is and what the main conflict is. 100 year war with the Fire Nation. In season 2, we find the bending of the rules. We see an expansion of the world by establishing new protagonists such as Toph, who eventually changes changes the way we view the magic system by inventing metal bending. But we also see that this war is not in black and white as it seemed in the first season. There are bad people on the good side of the war, or at least those without the more clean of morals, and people who wish to profit from the war for their own ends. And the main antagonist of the last season begins his character arc. He is not yet a full protagonist by the end of the season, but his worldview is realigning, while we are also introduced to a more effective antagonist in Azula. Season 3 finds the breaking of the world. This is not in the sense of world ending apocalypse, but instead changing the status quo to perhaps find something better or worse. In this case, an end to the 100 year war. This comes to a head by still continuing to expand the world beyond what we already know, by introducing blood bending and changing the perception of fire bending, plus continuing to highlight how the fire nation, the bad side, contains good people or people who are currently misunderstanding about the war. So how does all of this translate to the Matrix? The first film served as a simple zero to hero chosen one story, establishing the simulated world of the Matrix and the decimated real world, the ongoing antagonists of the agents, as well as how our hero fits into the world with the sequel expanding upon the first by showing that the rules of the Matrix are far beyond what initially thought. Introducing new characters, pro and antagonists. Introducing Zion and admittedly unsuccessfully showing what they are fighting for, which was the first real stumbling block. Aside from this being the last vestige of a free humanity, what was there in Zion to protect? The caves and grey backdrops? Would there not at least be a botanical garden or something? An attempt to restore plant life? Color? But the sequel also seemingly missed a step by upending the structure we knew from the original, as well as how Neo's status as the one and his journey so far were fabrications of the machines, as another means of control, already changing the status quo. And then we are expected to return to this structure and go back onto the Chosen One bandwagon. By the end of the film, the war is over, but there is no establishment of what this means aside from the machines leaving the humans alone. Are the humans going to rebuild the world? Stay in Zion? 
Why should we care that the war is over? The only real expansion is by showing the evolution of the programs within the Matrix. We already had Smith, who rebelled from his programming, but other than becoming a free agent, was still an antagonist, and really the true villain of the franchise, as well as Persephone, who wanted to experience what love felt like, but it's left ambiguous whether this is comprehension of emotion or just the same as a program reading a new line of code. In this film, we meet the family of programs, with the parents making a deal with the Frenchman in order to I think, allow their daughter to live a normal life as a little girl within the simulation of the Matrix, explaining how they want to give her the opportunity to be free to make her own choices about her existence, almost like sending her to a private school for a better education and greater opportunities in life, an action which arguably most real parents would do for their child, blurring the lines between real people and these programs. That then poses the question, do characters such as the Oracle simply exist as programs, or do they have that spark of life? Even Smith is halfway there as he says the purpose of life is death. All he is missing is that emotional angle, that death gives meaning to life because the limitation of a finite number of days is what inspires many to push forward, to create new life, to make discoveries and inspire through art. But of course, as Smith is a program who probably exists without a tangible sense of time, he cannot comprehend the idea of a legacy or a finite number of days. And it is debatable whether Neo comprehends what he had for breakfast, so that's pretty much all we get. But how does all of this translate into the action? Let's take a closer look at this film's fight scenes and find out. This scene serves as the final culmination of the themes interspersed in this franchise. Smith has spread to become the sole ruler of the Matrix, with it being explained that he has, in short, become an anti-one. A way for the equation of the Matrix to balance itself by having an equal quantity to Neo. Unfortunately, he's become game-breaking in his power level, and so Neo needs to do some Chosen One tech support. Ooh, and how are they going to up the ante for the last film, where Neo had to fight an army of Agent Smiths, and he barely got away with his life? By having Neo fight just one Smith with the same flight powers as him. Okay. Smith starts on the offensive with a punch that is parried by Neo with an outside kick. Neo retaliates with a series of chain punches courtesy of Wing Chun and a swift punch to the nose. Neo evades a swinging strike as he continues to chain punches, eventually blocking another downward strike as well as evading and blocking several more frankly robotic strikes before one finally breaks through and hits Neo in the face. But Neo recovers quickly and lands a roundhouse to the abdomen, following up with a combination of strikes including a toe kick and several punches to the face and body. Both of them land a punch at the face that sends their counter flying, with Neo landing gracefully, while Smith creates a crater. Is this to show that Neo is stronger than Smith, or does it indicate that he's not as experienced in using his newfound powers? You would think that Smith would be more experienced given how much longer he has existed than Neo. But that leads into the main problem here. It's boring. With a mostly grey and green colour palette, obscurity of vision due to the rain, and CGI puppets and a CGI sky, if the showdown was going to be 1v1, could you not at least make it interesting? By now, we know what the Matrix is, and that Neo, existing as the one, basically exists with cheat codes on. So really take advantage of that. Go all out, give us something like Dumbledore vs Voldemort, them constantly trying to outwit and one up the other by changing the world around them. Have Smith turn the rain into acid or meteors, have them throw lightning at each other, make the walls eat them, get creative and go all out. But no, instead we just watch this instead and have as much tension as two rocks being banged together. As Neo is thrown into a building and Smith gives his little monologue. Don't waste your breath, mate. You'll get more interaction out of a brick wall. The fight continues with Neo throwing a punch that Smith parries. A swift chop to the face from Neo follows another swift chain punch. A front kick and a jump side kick. Ooh, a tornado kick, which seems to chain into an outside kick. Not bad. As a combination of kicks is thrown by Neo, but he blocks a strike and delivers a side kick, followed by a roundhouse, a sweep, and a dragon tail kick. A lot of kicks so far. Maybe Keanu was trying to make up for the lack of kicks in the first film, thanks to his back injury. Neo continues with the kicks, finalizing this stage with a turn side kick that sends Smith out the window. As they continue on with the flying foo and end up shattering the glass panes in nearby buildings, could they not at least levy a tidal wave of glass shards at each other? I mean, what happened to Neo creating his own gravitational pull while getting to Trinity last movie? Eventually, they end up back on the street, or I suppose technically in the street given the crater, as Smith tries monologuing some more. That or Hugo Weaving was trying to figure out what the motivation of the characters was supposed to be. Why? Why get up? Why keep fighting? 
believe you're fighting for something or more than your survival. Can you tell me what it is? This is a Tolkien, Hugo. We don't do motivation here. Neo blocks several punches from Smith before he delivers a definitive punch to Smith's robbery face and sends him back with a cannon strike. But the fight is still not over as Smith continues on to deliver several punches to our wooden hero. But because symbolism, there is no final turnaround here. Neo allows Smith to convert him in an act of self-sacrifice, delivering Smith's code back to the source and ending Smith as a threat. Huh, so it was that easy. Why did Neo even need to fight Smith? I mean, surely you could've just cut out the middleman and surrendered immediately. Job done. What was the point? Well, I mean, we all know that Neo is not exactly the heaviest trench goes in the wardrobe. The film ends with the machines honouring their agreement with Neo, ending their assault on Zion and allowing the war to end. And then the fourth one happened, but most importantly, what do we make of this franchise? The Matrix started as the modern Star Wars for the new millennium unless you count the prequels. The telling of the hero's journey, but told in a new style with fresh ideas. But with the sequels came less limitations, and so any good ideas became weighed down by an overabundance of either bad ideas or poorly thought out ones. And the throw the baby out with the bathwater approach and reloaded only left the third film and audience in an awkward and confusing position. There's nothing wrong with being experimental and trying something radically new, but without a solid structure or spine to hold it together, the thing falls apart. In a way, this is a lot like our training. Certainly, we can practice more elaborate and certainly more fun techniques, but if we forget our fundamentals, then our technique just becomes weak and flawed. But what do you think? Am I being too hard on this film? I don't think I am, but comment below your opinion if you've seen this film yourself. And until next time, everyone, peace be with you.